What is up, plant people? Hey, it's Tuesday again, which means it's time once more for the Planthropology Podcast, the show where we dive into the lives, careers, and general amazingness of some very, very cool plant people. I'm Vikram Baliga, your host and your humble guide in this journey through the plant sciences, and I, as always, am so thrilled to be with you today. So this is one that I cannot wait for you to hear. My guest today is a PhD candidate in health psychology, studying psychoneuroimmunology, stress, aging. All those words will go way over my head. It just means she's a lot smarter than me. But I've been trying to get my friend Ilana Gloger on the podcast for quite a while. In addition to all those things, Alana is the host of the Dear Grad Student podcast, which is really one of my favorite shows. She dives into life and uh, challenges and struggles and equity and all kinds of other things in graduate school as she is a graduate student. And she's interviewed some really, really amazing folks. So I'm going to put a plug now for her for Dear Grad Student. I think you should definitely go and you should definitely be listening to that. But we had gone back and forth trying to figure out how we could collaborate for quite a while. You probably know I'm academic guy, so I actually got to be on her show as well, or I will be soon on her show. But Alana has recently discovered a love for exercising outdoors and going to the park and loving nature and all those things. And part of what I wanted to talk to her about is the ways in which nature affects our health and our mental health and recuperation and all of these things that we talk about a lot, how nature and being outside is good for you, but we don't necessarily always present the science behind it. So she talks a lot in this episode about the studies and what goes into figuring out how nature is good for us. And she tells a lot of her own personal story. Um, Alana has been such a good just podcast friend who I've made through Twitter. And uh, I have really enjoyed watching her show grow and develop and change. And it's it's really successful and it's really good. So I know you're going to love this episode with Alana Gloger. You'll get to find all of her contact information, how to hook up with her on social media. But I know you're going to love this one. Uh, I'll have some housekeeping and some other information and things at the mid-roll. But for now, let's jump into episode 68 of the Plant Apology Podcast with my friend, Alana Glover. Right. Well, Alana... I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to talk to you today. We've been trying to coordinate this for a while. And Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no. No, that's me too. Uh, yeah, it's li- both of us. Academia, man. Life is bonkers in bonkers. general. Uh, but how are you today? I am doing really well. It is a Saturday, and I feel like I'm just looking forward. I'm going to grocery shop later, and I feel like I woke up with sleep, and I have a cat here, and I'm doing great. Awesome. Sounds like a good morning. It is. Afternoon. I don't even know what time it is. Eh, it's uh, still morning. Yeah, it's for like, me. It's morning. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's close enough. <laughs> yeah. Close enough. So uh, for those of you, I mean, I talked about this in the intro, but uh, Alana does a lot of things. She's a PhD student. <laughs> uh, and, and if you have heard my story in the past, you know that that's one of the reasons we probably get along so well. Probably. Uh, is that we're both gluttons for punishment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we like pain, as I've mentioned. (laughs) Yep, yep, it's a thing. Uh, So why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? What what do you do now? What, where did you go to school? Where'd you grow up? Whatever you want to tell us. Oh my God, absolutely. So hi, everyone. I'm Alana. I'm a fifth year PhD, hopefully candidate by the time this comes out. I'm going to, I don't know if I can say that. I'm a student slash candidate. I'm an almost candidate. I am in the Department of Psychology at the University of Kentucky, and I study, oh, wow, psychology and the immune system, which, as we'll talk about in a little bit, actually has some very interesting intersections with plants, um, which might surprise a lot of folks. But I also host Dear Grad Student, which I guess I'll just give my slogan, uh, yeah. is a podcast for grad students to celebrate, commiserate, and support one another through grad school. I've been doing this for over a year, and Vikram has been like my podcast big brother. You've been so incredibly helpful, and you support the podcast so much. So I am super, super excited to be here. 
And I'll also say I'm a cat mom and I run and I play a lot of video games. And that's me. Let's play. Yeah, nothing. Look, okay. I play a lot of like simulation games. I'm not, I'm not like deep. Like my brother's like a League of Legends guy. Like I'm not like deep, right? He's deep. But I do a lot of Sims. I do a lot of Planet Coaster. If you, people are sleeping on Planet Coaster. Let me tell you. Making your own planets, like or planets, making your own roller coasters, designing your park, the whole thing. Oh my god, I I could do it for hours. I do. I do it for like nine hours at a time. My one real video game that I love is Red Dead Redemption Two. Other than that, yeah, I have no other like legitimacy. I just play like Sims and coaster games. But otherwise, <laughs> that's me. Oh, I that that's awesome. I love it. You know, uh, I have a. a f- almost six year old. And, um, we bought him for Christmas last year, a Nintendo switch. Oh. And I cannot tell you the mileage we get out of that thing. Oh, so yeah. it's funny. Cause people ask me like, I'll, yeah, I play video games. And in college I played a lot of whatever, uh, whatever I could get my hands on. Cause I had free time. Right. I, it's weird. Weird. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> uh, and now it's like, Oh, mostly Mario. I play a lot of Mario. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to switch my my boyfriend and I when we first met one of the first things we ever did was play Mario Kart but he was really good so he would laugh like I okay I grew up with two brothers and I would demolish them so I was like I'm gonna beat you in Mario Kart and he was lapping me I mean it was we don't play anymore it's like literally embarrassing like I can't bring him to parties when that game is happening because people are literally like okay let's play the next game with not with Luke he's too good he's so good at it's an it's awful I also loved like Mario Party, Mario yes. Sunshine, like loved those. Those were like my whole childhood. So I feel like I identify a lot with your child. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and and like if you're not willing to lose every friend every friend you've ever had over a game of Mario Party, you're, you're doing it wrong. Right. You're not living. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so so what um drove you towards psychology? What what made you want to get into that field? Yes. Um I don't know why, but the first thing that came to my mind was divorce. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, No, I'm just kidding. Absolutely not. But like, I feel like the reason I say that is everyone in psychology that I can think of, there's usually some sort of aspect of human behavior, aspect of their own lives, their own mind that like they kind of want a deeper understanding of, even if that's not the reason, right? So it's not like, oh, I've had depression, so I want to do depression research. It's not always that linear, but there is this sense of like, Humans are complicated and what we do, why we do them, why things happen that we don't understand. I mean, you could go forever, right? And so I think for me, I landed in psychology (laughs) similar to a lot of folks, right? I started as pre-med, right? Like, hi, I'm Alana. I used to be a pre-med major. I did finish the degree, but I did not go to med school or anywhere close to it. I actually decided to switch that after my, my partner, Luke, who I've mentioned, He broke his ankle and I took him to the hospital and they had to do surgery and they were like, we're going to do a nerve block. Like, do you want to watch? And I'm like, yes, I'm going to be a doctor. Thank you so much for asking. I would like to know everything about this. Right. Because I was like a sophomore in college, junior in college. And I was like, that's me. I'm like very important. Thank you for asking. And so they have this needle for the nerve block, which like it's like a foot long. Because they need to be able to, like, put it anywhere in the body, right? Like, it's like, it was like white. It was a whole thing. So they, this doctor who was probably just busy, literally had it in his hand like a fist and just stabbed it down at the top of his leg and just started, like, cranking it into his leg. And I was like, I am going to die. Like, I'm going to pass out right here and I'm going to die here. And I was like, I can't go to med school. So... I was already a psych major and I thought I wanted to go to med school anyways for psychiatry. So I started down the journey of like, well, what are the other options for a psychology career? Like, what else could this look like? And I still had this interest in biology, which kind of was where we land on like the psychology and immunology place. Um, There was this paper that I read for a class I took that was talking about they actually brought in a bunch of students over the summer, put them in a basement. And they gave them a virus. They gave them the cold virus. And if you, this paper is so funny. It was in like the 70s, I think. But it's funny because they were literally like counting tissues. They were like 
quantifying the amount of snot they had and how often they were blowing their nose. And like, they were like taking antibody titers and like doing the whole thing of like tracking the course of their cold infection and their symptoms. And at the end, they found that people who, before they were ever infected, had reported like more social support, better well being, not only were they sick for less time, but their symptoms were less severe. Hmm. And it was. And it was statistically significant across everything. And so the field of psychoneuroimmunology, I mean, it was already kind of born, but really started to boom. Because people are like, it's not like the social support was there. It's not like we had friends and family with them. It was just this like baseline level of I'm a well-supported person. What does this mean about my health? And that blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. And that is kind of how I got started in it all. Fascinating. To me. I know <laughs> it's fascinating, and I, I, it makes you know. It's funny when we talk about science and and like quote unquote new discoveries in right. science because it's like if you were to ask a lot of people like, do you feel better when you have the support of other humans? It's like right, yeah, yes, yeah. but to be actually able to quantify that and prove that from a physiological standpoint is right. just, that's it, fascinating to me. I mean, and that's the thing that gets me. So I've actually transitioned now into looking at how we age. So I'm not necessarily studying older people, but like midlife into older mm-hmm. age, like you, you can imagine like two 80 year olds, one has never been sick a day in their life and they, you know, fall, they die in their sleep. And the next one, they've been sick for 40 years. Maybe it's like chronic conditions, cancer, whatever. And they die the same day. One of them lived a healthy life for 80 years. The other one lived a healthy life for only a 40, even though they chronologically lived the same amount of time, right? right? So I'm really interested in like, when does that start branching off? Like what determines who is aging better? And so I am able to look at things, whether it be like through blood draws or different things, like we can see literally like T cells or B cells or different markers in their blood that tell us all of these things about their life that are sort of determinant in like, if they're more stressed, they're aging poorly. If they have lower socioeconomic status, they're aging poorly. Just all of these different things. So I I could keep going. I'll reel it in. But yeah, that stuff just, it fascinates me because we're taking measures of like T-cell ability to respond to vaccine. And there are psychological and behavior factors that are genuinely impacting and changing that and vice versa. And it's just wild to me. That's so cool. And you know, this is this is a tangent or it's a rabbit I'm going to chase. Uh <laughs> which uh as we talked earlier is is a thing I do. Uh I talked to my students recently um about ecosystems and I I promise I'm going somewhere with this. No, uh, I, I can already tell. We can kind of put it at the end of the semester. Uh we used to do it up front, but I like to build towards, you know, we get all the specifics about plants, blah blah blah, and then we talk about okay, what do they do? You know, like how do they interact? And we talked a little bit about how as humans, we are not separate from nature, right? We are part of nature. Uh, And if you look at levels of complexity, when you look at biology, you see some patterns that sort of repeat themselves. And so uh, a healthy ecosystem has lots of different things, lots of diversity that, that boosts it up, that holds it up. So when you pull one of those Jenga blocks, the whole tower doesn't fall down of an ecosystem. So a resilient, right. healthy ecosystem has lots of moving parts and lots of species and lots of things. And since then, and this is, it's, it's so interesting that you talk about what you do, because this has been rattling around in my brain for a few weeks, is that how do we manage the ecosystem that is our own life and our own health and our own biology. Exactly. And that's exactly it. There's actually a a term in psychology, we'll call it allostatic load. And it's kind of exactly that. It's like your homeostasis. It's like, how much can you take on before it's causing damage? And the more of this sort of global general load that you're taking on, you know, we can basically we can just like tell you're going to have more inflammation in your body. Um, different functions are going to be worse. If you get sick during that time, well, actually you're more vulnerable to get sick. If you get sick, it might take longer to feel better just from like how much we are physiologically taking on. And I think that that's an amazing point and probably early like seminal papers. I'm sure they actually do discuss this, that we are just another like species requiring homeostasis that are affected by our environment. 
So I also study stress. That's like my big thing. Um, stress and how it affects immunity. So I feel like I identify with exactly what you're talking about. And it's why I'm interested. Humans have limits. What are they? What's happening when we reach them? Can we change them? So fascinating. So fascinating <laughs> to me. Uh, I could, okay. I got, So I have to reel Destroy in my, my brain sometimes because I'm like <laughs> so many thoughts yes. that are not relevant right now. Uh, <laughs> but we may have to talk again about Fair enough. some of these other things. Um, so that that sort of leads me into our, our like kind of where we're going with this episode. So uh, spoilers, we recorded an episode together just now for Dear Grad Student, which yes. if I if my brain is working correctly, this episode, as you're, if you're listening to it the day it comes out, is something like January 18th, right around the beginning of the semester. So I, I like talking to people who are not, uh, quote unquote, strictly plant people, because I think it gives interesting perspectives on how folks outside of the discipline, so to speak, view nature in the environment. So uh, we talked during Dear Grad Student about how you have started getting into nature more. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, I can. Okay. I I have a a history of nature that we actually didn't talk about as well that I think I should preface with. I feel like, again, I feel like I'm in a support group. Hi, I'm Alana (laughs) and like, I'm afraid of bugs, but I, I hate bugs and I am not proud of this. It's not something that I like. It's not even something that's conscious. Um, but I have always loved nature, but I get like really held back by like bugs buzzing in my ear or like fear of ticks because I grew up in the Northeast or whatever that like truly stop me from enjoying these things. I also have cats. So like half the plants I could own are literally deadly to them. So it's like, I really have a lot of roadblocks in front of me, but through, well, right before COVID, I should say about a year before I had ran a half marathon and I didn't train super well, but I like did it. And I was like, I'm going to run another one. Then COVID hit. And so I keep deferring this half marathon, but I'm like, okay, I have to do it. At some point, they're not going to let me and I'm going to lose the money I spent. So that along with needing other ways to improve my mental health that aren't in a gym of people who probably aren't vaccinated led me to start working out outside. And I am not one of those people, like, I don't really feel comfortable running on roads. In fact, I feel very uncomfortable running on roads. Yeah. I like to listen to audiobooks when I run. Um, and usually I try to listen so loud I can't hear myself breathing. And the reason I do that is because hearing myself breathe heavily actually increases my heart rate and my tension because I'm like, wow, I'm having a really hard time. So I'm listening to loud sounds, right? And so there are a couple of really great parks where I live, um, two that I can think of off the top of my head that have, you know, different paths that are perfectly marked into a mile. So if in my head, I'm like, oh, I want to run two miles. I'm like, great, two loops. And it helps me mindlessly be in nature then as opposed to being like, how far have I gone? Mm -hmm. Um, And so something that I've noticed, and this was actually the first time that I really noticed like, wow, there is benefit to this being outside and being in a place like this. There were two times actually. The first was my first run outside during the summer. So last winter, I had gone for a couple of walks around this park and, you know, it's like pretty and like barren in a winter way. But the first time I went over the summer, I like hadn't been active for a while and I got there and it was like a different park. Like the trees were so green and I couldn't even share Luke is colorblind. So I was like, I can't even tell you they're (laughs) so green. Like it was so vivid and like the way that they were canopying everything. It was just like one of the most memorable walks of my life, which sounds I guess not ridiculous, but it felt ridiculous at the time. Sure, yeah. And the other time was when I found a new trail at my favorite park that I didn't know about. It's not a trail. It was a paved pathway, and I was just like, where does this go? There is this river that – or stream, I should say, that runs through the park that I never knew about. And just like the running water and the trees over the – I mean, it's just like the way that that helps me realize that like grad school is not so big and like really is such a physical escape. Um, I've said this on the podcast. I don't love where I live, which is fine. Like you move for grad school. Sometimes it's not like the place you want to spend the rest of your life. But when I'm in those places, you know, I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in Cleveland. There's a a metro park. Like There's national parks in Cleveland. So I'm used to like big foresty, whatever. And here I'm like little trees. It has still, it has just been such an escape in a way that I didn't expect. And I feel like, I don't know, maybe I'll work on the bug thing, but, uh, (laughs) It's new for me. It's definitely new. It's a process. It's a yeah. process. And and I think it's 
uh, I talked with a previous guest about the way we approach things like people being afraid of insects or mm. – uh, we were talking about bats specifically. Oh, terrified. Uh, in, in, really? Oh, not I a, mean – Not a so, fan? Oh, my gosh. I – I am really afraid of most bugs. Like if spiders in my house, I'm not afraid of it. But like, have you ever been to like a cave system? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. okay. And there's like cave crickets. I could not tell you a worse nightmare than my experience realizing that cave. Like I didn't know. I had never known about cave crickets until I was in one of those like little tiny passages. Oh, yeah. And they were like touching. Oh, my God. I I can see I the anxiety even, on your face as you talk about honestly, this. Honestly, I can't. Like, it was <laughs> it was the worst. And there was even, like, I didn't even know. I, like, went on the cave cricket tour, which is, God, okay. And we had to exit. And the only way to exit was basically through, like, a canopy of cave crickets. And everyone walking through was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, they're harmless. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I literally, I put my head, like, my hands over my eyes like this. And I did, like... Which like is it the Naruto run where I literally was just like <laughs> like I just like I ran my head was straight down on the ground I couldn't see anything and I just like ran the thirty feet out of the cave and I'm like, <laughs> that's me and I hate yeah. that that's me but I get I hate bugs I hate them I get it I get it and, and when we talk about accessibility for nature uh, that is something that we have to be real conscious of as like plant people nature people is to not just be like oh that's dumb you know whatever no it's real that's a real thing <laughs> I uh, wish it wasn't. <laughs> I, I'll tell you a story. One of my uh, my grad student, his girlfriend is terrified of butterflies. I also hate butterflies. Butterfly terrified. museums. Oh, my gosh. When you I can't go to butterfly museums. It's just horrifying, too much. Horrifying experiences. I've been so, to them. They suck. Oh, no. I And, and it's <laughs> when I when he first told me that I was like, OK, but uh-huh. the more I thought about it, I was like, OK, uh, yeah, that's right. Re- it's reasonable. It's legit. We did a butterfly release up here one day. And it was cool, right. but I have never seen someone run so fast as this this poor young woman. Aww. Like it was just like ah, I mean, okay. Objectively, it was kind of funny, right. but I, I <laughs> you felt, no, you understood. <laughs> I, I understood, and and so I think that that's actually a really important point that like when we get into and and it's fun hearing you talk because you know I've grown up being a plant nerd, and it's fun watching people discover a love of the environment and a love of plants. And, and, and I tell people that they don't have to go into like a national forest to love nature, nature, go to your local park and take a walk. Like right. the wonder of discovery and, and the wonder of just like learning a new thing like that's so cool. But, but we have to be careful sometimes as like plant people or, or uh, maybe anyone just to not gatekeep and be yeah. like, Oh no, if you're scared of bugs, blah, blah, no, nah, it's fine. Like it's fine. You, you'll yeah. get there or you won't. And then you can still find ways to enjoy a park, nature. Right. And regardless, anyway. And you know, and it's funny because Luke, again, my boyfriend, he's really the plant person of our relationship just because he likes to backpack. So, like, okay. he's gone like backpacking in like the backwoods of like Utah for like weeks at a time. Um, he likes to go on hikes. He was on a cross country team and he would like trail run. Like, that was. So his thing, and when we started dating, I was like, oh, yeah, like, I can go camping. Like, yes, I'm an outdoors girl. You found her. It's me. (laughs) And I was not. I mean, and I, like, did my best. But we actually recently went on a vacation to Tennessee. We went to this thing. It was called a getaway cabin. Highly recommend. Um, They're absolutely incredible. They're out of a lot of major cities. And there was a hike nearby, and it was the middle of summer, and I didn't think this through. But we went on this hike, and, like, I mean, there's ticks everywhere because it's the middle of Tennessee in the heat of summer. And I learned later that Lyme disease actually isn't even there. Like, it doesn't exist there, so I shouldn't have been so concerned. But, like, I think we were 30 seconds into a hike, and I was like, I can't do it. I actually can't continue on. Like, I was was claustrophobic. That's what it felt like. And I felt so bad about it because he's such an outdoorsy person. Like, you can go alone. And he's like, I want to do it with you. And it's like, it's tough. Like, I want to be. So I'm trying to break those boundaries. And I feel like starting with a local park has been good. And I found things I like. Like, I like the canopy of trees. Mm-hmm. Like, parks that have fewer trees, I'm like, you're doing less for me. So I like that I'm, like, learning. I'm learning what I like about it. It's like an exploration for me. That's super cool. Uh, and, and it's a great segue And I think, you know, our kind of main topic for today. Uh, so I'm going to uh, – I'm actually remembering to do this today. We're going to take a break. Okay. I usually just, like <laughs> – 
I usually I usually just like find a like a breaking conversation. I'm like, oh, yeah, break. But that's we'll, what I do. We'll take a break right now. <laughs> hey, welcome to the mid roll. Your favorite part of the episode. I'm just kidding. Again, I hope this is nobody's favorite part of the episode. But I just wanted to say hi. How you doing? Is your year going well so far? If you're listening to this when it comes out, it is, um, I don't know, January something, 11th, 2022, which I don't know what future listeners are going to know about our future, but so far, so good. Things are going all right. Hey, you should connect with Planthropology all the places. I am on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Search for Planthropology, which is anthropology with a PL slapped on the front. Look for the green background with a bristlecone pine. And that's me. That's me. You can also get on Facebook and join the Planthropology's Cool Plant People Facebook group. I think it's great. We have fun in there. There's lots of memes, all kinds of other good things. I'm also thinking about starting a Discord. I'm not really very good at Discord, but I've been having a little more fun with it recently and trying to figure out how to use the thing. So I'm thinking about doing that. If that's something you would like, hit me up and let me know. Uh, It'll be open to everyone. I'll put out invites and all of the things for that. Um, Also, if you'd like to support the show, uh, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com slash planthropology, just like Jen Wears Hats did recently, which I'm just floored when people decide that they want to do that. It it blows me away. Uh, and I, it's so much appreciated. Uh, Jen says, a first year horticulture student in North Texas. I really appreciate your work and absolutely love this podcast. Thank you. Jen, no, th- thank you. Really. I mean, absolutely from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. It means the world to me. Uh, if you would like to throw a couple of bucks this way too, I will literally spend it on coffee. I really mean that. Also, thank you to the Texas Tech Department of Plant and Soil Science for uh, just supporting the show and and letting it happen. It's been an amazing experience and I get so much departmental support and it's really, really very cool. So 2022 is going to be a good year. Lots of good stuff coming your way. Probably some video content, uh, some other things, assuming I can find the time to do those things. But definitely, um, Lots more podcast coming your way. We'll have some new format and some new scheduling things that I'll talk more about next week. And I think next week, I'm also going to start talking about uh, reviews and reading your reviews. If you want to leave me a review at Podchaser or Apple or anywhere else, that'd be great. I would love for you to do that. I may read it on the show. And we're going to start that back up again next week. But for now, let's hear a promo for the It's Not Rocket Surgery podcast, which is a great science show from our friends in the big island down south, Australia, and uh, a proud fellow member of the Podfix Network. So get ready for a promo for It's Not Rocket Surgery in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 30 seconds. Ignition sequence start. Here we got a roll program. It's Not Rocket Surgery, the latest in science, technology, and geek culture. Astronauts report it feels good. Sunday nights from 1030. Broadcast and streaming live. Podcast at all the usual podcast places. Follow and like us on Facebook and on Twitter at RCKTSRGRY. Uh, yes, we've had a problem. Computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. The ankle has landed. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I know, it was a long break. I know. Very long. Um, so so you we were talking about before the break just how you're discovering things you love about nature and tree canopies and just like being outdoors. And mm-hmm. uh, have you found in your own life, in your own mental well-being, physical well-being, that that has like had a big impact on you? Oh my gosh. It actually has in a way that I feel like I didn't believe it could, which sounds so, I mean, the most dramatic. If you listen to my podcast, I'm very dramatic. I can't help it. <laughs> but I feel like I always thought that was such a cliche. I'd be like, oh, being outdoors, my mental health. I'm like, yeah, okay, like fine. But as you and I spoke about before we started recording, I recently lost my cat. Um, He died suddenly at four years old in my bedroom at two o'clock in the morning. It was like absolutely tragic. This was like a cat that knew my whole soul. And one of the first things that I did getting out of the house was to go to my favorite park. And it's like down the street from me. So I'm very, very close to it. I probably could run to it, but we're not there yet. (laughs) So I drove there. Um, But I went for like, I don't know if it was like just like a two mile run. And after I finished the run, it was one of the first cold days here. And I just got my stuff in my car and I closed the door and I just like looked. 
And I think I sat there for like 25 minutes and just kind of let myself cry. No one else was at the park. Like it was just me. And usually it's a really busy park. And I was like, this is kind of peaceful, but like weird. Why is no one here? And, you know, I thought I saw a cat in the clouds, like the whole, you know, I went through the whole thing. And I just remember feeling so refreshed in a way that I was like, whoa, I didn't even know I needed that. Like just to be outside. So I have just found that other than just getting me out of the house, which I'm a homebody, so that's hard anyways, I feel like it just (laughs) reminds me of like life and joy and like, I don't know. I I just think about all these things living around me and existing. And like, I have been listening. I think you're one of the people that got me into Outlander. Were you on that Twitter thread when I was like, should I watch Outlander? Do you watch Outlander? I I have not actually. Okay. Then you're not that person. Someone, someone suggested I watch the show Outlander. I did. um, And now I'm reading the books or listening to the audio books. And there's something about the woman having a British accent and speaking slowly and walking through nature yeah. that just reminds me to like breathe and slow down. And I, I know when I've listened to the audiobook inside, it doesn't have the same effect on me just in terms of like the calmness. So in terms of well being, I, I've never been an outdoorsy person, but I've also now realized like I've never felt better than the days where I go outside and I walk or I go outside and I run. And it is the outside aspect doing it on the treadmill doesn't hit the same none of it. So for me, it's like, it's new, but it does, it really does help. And I find myself like buying like running gloves and like little Under Armour things. Cause I'm like, I'm going to go outside this winter and like, I'm going to be warm and there's gonna be nature. And it's the only thing that clears me at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, that's, and that's so cool to hear you say, because we are a species that has, you know, co-evolved and grown up in forests and in natural ecosystems. And then we, over time, because of the way society goes, you know, we've moved indoors and there's certainly benefits to that. Right. You know, like we don't get hailed on as much anymore, uh, <laughs> hopefully. Right. Um, but I think we, I, I know in my life, the, the times that I have found myself spending the most time inside, I feel the most unwell, mm. uh, physically, mentally, otherwise. I had an office for a while in my previous career where we were on the second floor of the building in an old bank lobby. That was our office was a bank office (laughs) and we had zero windows. I couldn't Mm. see outside. And like, I would just find myself like losing time. Like time would skip for me. Yeah. And, and, and and then moving into this job where I literally work in a greenhouse, like my office is in the middle of a greenhouse complex. Uh, I'm around plants all the time and it, it, has had great impacts on my own life and well-being. Yeah. And, you know, we know this. We'll talk about this in a bit. I don't have the exact studies to cite, but we know that this is actually a legitimate thing, right? It's not just like this placebo effect of like, oh, you know, we just think that plants do this for us. They they really do. They really do affect health and well-being. And I think that, you know, I think about this when I – was apartment shopping, like the views outside my window. First I was doing it for my cats. I was like, there need to be trees. But now I realize for me, like we have a little stream in our back, like not our backyard, but like down yonder. And we have trees and just looking out and like enjoying the view. It sounds so basic. Like I think about the people that you have on your podcast talking about these like really intense detailed things or like they had this realization in childhood, right? Like I'm new, but I just can't, I can't reiterate like how, life-changing it's been. And I feel kind of silly because I feel like I was one of those people who's like, inside is great. I'm the best inside. I love being inside. I'm cozy, blah, blah, but, but I'm not. And so this is me admitting it. And <laughs> if anyone asks, no, I didn't. But it's, it's your true. secret safe with me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what does like kind of the transition, what does the literature say? You know, and, and you don't have to like necessarily quote specific studies, sure. but when we think about like the body of evidence for the benefits that you were discussing yeah. of spending time in nature, how does that work? How, you know, if you're, you're studying psychology and the immune system, like what benefits does nature play on those things? Yeah. And so I think the first thing that like, whenever you think about these kinds of questions, maybe plant people don't feel this way, but I feel like the general population might automatically assume that this is like pseudoscience. Right. Or that this is just sort of some sort of like pop psychology that's like, oh, yeah, do this more and you'll feel better. Like, you know, snake oil. The thing that's really interesting about my field and that I like the most is that 
It is not snake oil. Um, we are using biological measurements, physiological measurements to show that the body is benefiting, that well-being is benefiting. So there are two categories that I'll sort of put these into in terms of benefits. One would sure. be like the, the clinical one, so like actually treating mental health problems. The other just being like a general healthy population one. So one of the papers that I cannot find, it's driving me crazy. My mentor has talked about this. She did a, like a career award acceptance a few years ago. And she talked about the paper that got her into psychology. And if we can find it, we'll link it below. Sure. But the paper that got her in, it was, she got her PhD in the late nineties. And this paper essentially had people who were staying in the hospital. They may have been cancer patients, but I don't remember off the top of my head. And they looked at their outcomes in terms of recovery, in terms of well-being, in terms of nutrition, X, Y, Z, and whether or not they had a window and how big the window was in their hospital room. So we're talking like you're still in a hospital. That's still the environment. The, di the only difference really other than, I mean, maybe treatments and some things were a little bit different, but like the window was the big deal, seeing sure. the nature outside. And it was like people who had a bigger window that they were facing spent less time in the hospital. They did better while they were in the hospitals. They were on less like supportive, whatever that was in the 90s uh, or perhaps the 80s. And that blew my mind that doctors who are have medicine, like medicine yeah. that 50 years ago we never could have imagined that we have. And that's still not all the pieces. And so if you look at hospitals, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and you look at hospitals now, a lot more of them have green spaces. Mm. A lot more of them have outdoor spaces for patients. And, par and part of that is for patients and for the people who work there. Um, and so when we think about just the influence that nature can have on wound healing, um, that's a big area of literature. It's a little bit older. Sure. So people don't look at that as much anymore, um, but they would like literally measure out, they would <laughs> give people wounds in a lab um, and measure how quickly they healed from it, which is wild. The other aspect of nature is in a clinical sense. So I used to be a therapist. I switched out of doing that because it wasn't quite my thing, but I learned a lot about human behavior and, and well-being. And so there is a lot with nature and mindfulness. In fact, I'm sure that you could probably have an entire episode with someone who knows a little bit more about mindfulness, but mindfulness is all about uh, putting your mind in the moment. And that is usually, you know, people who benefit from mindfulness, uh, perhaps they are often worrying about the future, worrying about the past. Um, you might have folks who have gone through a trauma yeah. and so living in the moment would might bring that back up. And so this is a way to train yourself to be like, how am I doing? What am I feeling right now? What's going on around me? It's like it, it kind of grounds you. And it's very, very well evidence-based in the literature. But one of the most popular mindfulness techniques is called leaves on a stream. Have you ever heard of this? I haven't. It's almost like a joke amongst psychologists that it's like, oh, we'll just do leaves on a stream. Like, like leaves on a stream is just like such a thing. So leaves on a stream is, you know, you close your eyes, you pay attention to your breaths. And then you imagine a stream and you imagine a tree and you literally use this visualization of nature to put thoughts um, or different things that are coming up onto this leaf and you watch it go down the stream. And it's a mindfulness technique to be like anything that comes up in that moment, put it on a leaf, let it go down the stream. Anything upsetting, put it on the leaf, let it go down the stream. And like I said, it's so known among psychologists. It is a thing. And to use this kind of nature visualization. And when we think about like meditation or different mindfulness techniques for relaxation or for calming, nature is one of the most powerful tools that we have. And so even in like an imaginal sense, nature can have an in intense impact on well-being and our ability to ground ourselves in the moment. Wow. That's really cool. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> I know uh, I said a lot. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just I'm I'm processing through that, and it, you know I listened to this other podcast um, about virology because I'm a nerd. Uh, okay. it, yeah, and and one of the guys on there always says the the plural of anecdote is not data, but you have the data. 
Like, mm. it, it, because like you said earlier, when we start talking about some of these things, the, the health benefits of nature, mindfulness, leaves on a stream even, it does, I think, get taken as pseudoscience because of the way we present science sometimes yeah. in the mainstream. Right. And, but but the fact that like, it's known in your discipline that this is, this is real stuff. This There's oh, real yeah. hard data that proves this. I love that so much because I think one of the challenges um, for someone like me who talks about plants and tries to give a wide variety of people an appreciation for plants, for my students, anyone else, having some ammunition like that to say, look, no, this is not just me saying, oh, go walk around in the forest and you'll feel better. Uh, right. It's like, no, go do it because like science has proven that this is a thing you should do. It is important yeah. that we maintain these ecosystems. It's important that we protect nature because of how much it, it in and of itself, because of its own intrinsic value, but also yeah. look at all the stuff it does for us. Look at what it does for our health and our well-being. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've also seen that like that idea of like walking through nature. I mean, it can be protective against dementia <laughs> um, and other things that you were talking about, like how you kind of have to convince people. I mean- the spiel I just gave, like, it was really common with therapy clients, right? You're like, go outside and take a walk. And they're like, come on, like, that's the advice you're, right? Like, I pay you how much, well, first off, I didn't get paid, but like, I pay how much to come here and, you know, come to therapy for you to tell me to go outside. Um, and that's a skill we usually call behavioral activation, but there's something about being outside that really does do it. And I think that for folks who are listening, who are like wondering if it's pseudoscience, I mean, I don't think your folks would, but just people in general I try to turn them towards the literature where it's like, first off, psychology in general, we kind of have to convince people like, yes, we are measuring real things. Yes, this is well validated. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, which is also why I kind of like the intersection that I land at because by measuring biological things, people seem to have like, there's more legitimacy to it. Um, but I just think that once you do kind of get people on board that like, hey, this could be a thing, then you start seeing the benefits. Um, and I, like I said, I'm in an aging literature space right now. So this is why like it can be really good for folks who have dementia, who are maybe in a care facility, why outdoor time is so healing and so important for them. Like that's not just, oh, so they feel good in the moment. Like people live longer when they are exposed to outdoor spaces. Like this isn't a joke, you know, like we're, this is yeah. serious stuff. <laughs> Uh, well, for sure. And I have a I have a colleague right now who is um, doing her PhD on horticultural therapy. Oh. And I'm, I'm trying to get her to find time to come talk to me on the show. But oh, that sounds she, awesome. she's working with uh, uh, veterans and uh, dealing with post traumatic stress and things like that. Yes. And the benefits of gardening and having green space yes. and sensory gardens on all of those things on yes. dealing with the symptoms of post -traumatic, traumatic stress. And it's like taking care of something is so powerful. It's why sometimes you'll have like pet therapy um, or like I think about things I've seen with like inmates, inmates who take care of cats, inmates who take care of dogs, inmates who take care of a green space um, at the facility that they are at. That is incredibly beneficial, not just to be working with that thing, right? So not just working with that plant, but the act of taking care of something, psychologically, what that can mean and the fulfillment and satisfaction, right? So it's not even just the physical thing, but there's all these different layers of like what it can do for a person. I don't know. I'm getting like nerdy into it, but like psych the psychology piece of it is fascinating. So cool. It's so cool. No, that, that's interesting. And that's such a good perspective. I like having well-rounded and multiple perspectives on the same issue. Like, you know, from, from a, a, a non-plant person in the, I, I, I don't know. I just think that we're, when we think about science and we think about medicine and everything else, it's really easy again, because of the way that it's typically presented in popular culture that here's one study that says this, and this is the truth and all of this, these things. When I think those of us who do the science and do the work, it's like, okay, that's a piece of this, this grand tapestry uh, of us trying to tell our own story and us trying to figure out our own biology and our own minds and all of these things. Right. And, and so we you know, are starting to maybe surround some of the truths involved in that, but it takes so many different pieces and so many different players. And I just think it's, it's cool to investigate that from different angles. 
Absolutely. And, you know, from that, I want to piggyback on something that is a little bit of a sneak peek of what we talked about on Dear Grad Student. But you talked a lot, and I'm sure you've said this on your podcast, about your interest in like urban spaces um, and water conservation and nature in urban spaces. And of course, we talked about my park running. But there's also health benefits to that. In addition to like lower pollution, like not even necessarily that. But when we think about the places that people grow up and their context, we call this like socioeconomic context and how many parks there are and things like that can affect how they age the rest of their life. Even if they live there up until like 10 years old, that sets the stage for aging and their life and their health until they die. So I would love if people like we were talking about science policy, right? Like I wish people understood that. That like when you are depriving folks of green spaces and all of the all of the negative in the moment things that that's having on the ecosystem and those people has a lasting impact. Like the body remembers, right? Especially when you're growing up and your body is learning how to do things, how to regulate things and what it needs. If it isn't learning how to do that in certain ways or it is not, what's the word, like fulfilled in certain aspects – you have deficits in different areas. And I don't mean deficits like cognitive deficits, but rather if your immune system never got to thrive, it's never going to thrive, right? It can only, it's its own limit. So when we think about well-being and we think about enhancing that and the long-term impacts it can have on health and the way that nature, which is all around us, which should be accessible to everyone, can have that kind of impact, it just, it really should be higher on the, I don't know, list of important things when we think about public health, and at least in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. I love that so much. I love that so much. And that's, yeah, there's some groups I'm starting to work with that uh, do more community garden stuff and public green space. And um, I have a, a, a good friend who um, has a PhD in epidemiology. Oh. And the way that she is uh, uh, applying that these days, she's a public health professional, uh, is in working with school gardens and community gardens and all of those things. And she started a nonprofit here locally that oh, cool. uh, works with all these different groups to try to find resources and stuff from, but she takes it all from a public health standpoint. And I think that is a really so cool, cool thing. Definitely. Um, goodness. Like we were talking about earlier, it's funny how fast 43 minutes goes. Very fast. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> um, so we'll start kind of wrapping up. Um, a question I always ask my guests um, is kind of like you do on your show, actually, is just to sort of wrap things up. If you had a piece of advice and that could be plants or life or uh, best soup recipe, I don't care, whatever it is, uh, what would you like our listeners to take home with them? If you had if you could say one thing, it's like, remember this, what would that one thing be? Yes. Wow. I need a second to right. think about it. I think my top piece of advice or not advice, but my big takeaway message would be in all of the ways that you think that plants that surround you, plants that you work with and all behavior related to plants is impacting your health. You are correct about, <laughs> I would say it, it is as beneficial as it feels. And with that, I would say, continue encouraging people to be in outdoor spaces and spending time in outdoor spaces and making outdoor spaces accessible. I know that you've had a episode, at least one of them, if I can remember, just talking about accessibility of nature spaces and like everyone should be able to access that and it's beneficial for everyone to be able to do so. So I don't know. I just feel like the fact that we know that it is literally affecting our immune system, like this has come up a lot with COVID, right? It's affecting how well people cope with COVID. Like, yeah. pay attention to that. And and it's real. And I don't know, I, giving some legitimacy. Like, I feel like plant people are like, it's really good for me that I do this. It is. I can tell you that it is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's such good advice. Um, gosh, I have enjoyed this so much. Like, so me much. Too. Uh, where Where all can people find you? Oh, yes. That is a great question. So I am on Twitter, Instagram, and I have a website for my podcast. So you can find me personally on Twitter at Alana underscore Gloger. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore G-L-O-G-E-R. I'm also on Twitter at Dear Grad Student and Instagram at Dear Grad Student Pod. You can go to my website, deargradstudent.com. We have merch. I have merch not related to Dear Grad Student. Um, 
I have a Patreon page. Vic Grimms is an amazing long-term supporter of the podcast on Patreon. But uh, yeah, I'm everywhere. I'm really, really bad at DMs. But if you tweet at me, I'm really, really good at those. <laughs> and confirm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that that's not supposed to be a dunk. No, no, no I, I know, I know. It's just uh, so true. <laughs> uh, uh, but no, I, I and I love uh, following you on all the places. Uh, uh, Alana is certainly a good follow. So oh, thanks. Uh, you should definitely go do that and listen to Dear Grad Student. It's such a yes. good show. It's so good. And, and if you're not a grad student, maybe you're a professor or you're in research, send it to a grad student. There you go. Uh, well, <laughs> and I would say that uh, Dear Grad Student is a piece for me on the bigger implications of life in general couched in a grad student podcast. Whoa. So the, 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 the struggles that, uh, people go through in grad school are not necessarily unique to grad school. They present in unique ways. Right. But I think for anyone who is a human trying to keep being a human, Mm -hmm. this is such a great show. And it, it, uh, uh, addresses uh, mental health and the internet intersectionality of, of gender and sexuality and all the things that go into it. And so many things that is couched in a grad student podcast, but it's so I, for me, I think it's so much bigger than that. And I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, and you did hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's a lot less about like, what do you research or like, how do I get a job or like blah, 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 blah. And it's a lot more about like, what was it like to go through the job market? Like, are you good? Like, you know, what was it like going through a thesis? Like, how do I mentally deal with that? Or like racism in academia and calling that shit out and different things like that. So I really appreciate the shout out. I appreciate that you like it so much. And I hope that it's helpful for folks who are finding out about it for the first time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on with me. It's been lots of fun. Of course. I'm happy to come whenever. And everyone listening, your episode on Dear Grad Student will be out at some point. If it's going to be out here in January, I'll try to I'll try to sneak mine out around the same time. So stay tuned for sure. And I'll definitely uh, share all that when it comes out. So um, thank you all for listening. Thank you for being a part of this. As always, you know, I love you folks. And uh, we will talk again soon. I almost said hashtag bye, but then I didn't. <laughs> Hey, y'all listen to Alana and you go outside. She's smart. She knows what she's talking about. Thanks so much again, Alana, for being on with me and just for being my friend and hanging out and uh, letting me be part of this podcast journey. Y'all stay tuned here in a couple of weeks. Actually, I don't know exactly when, but here soon for um, my episode on Dear Grad Student. I'll be posting all kinds of stuff about that. Thanks again one more time to the Texas Tech Department of Plant and Soil Science for all the support and mostly thanks to you, the listener. For just being here, for being a part of this. You know I love you guys so much. Uh, Keep being cool. Keep being kind. If you have not yet been kind, maybe start doing that. It's a new year. Let's let's turn over a new leaf. Um, I mentioned a little bit that our schedule would be changing some. And get ready for weekly content. Yeah, I've decided to just jump in. And and I have mostly done weekly content on and off for a couple of years. But we're going full bore. So we've got some cool stuff coming up. I will talk in more detail next week about that. But until then, y'all be good, y'all be safe, and keep being cool plant people.